Welcome to Strength of Materials N6. Today's video is on one of the new modules. The title is Close Coiled Helical Springs. This is not a difficult module to understand, so please bear with me because I strongly feel that this is one of those modules where students get full marks in the exam. Let's begin. First, we will talk about the dimensions that you find on a spring and also we will introduce the labels that we will use for those dimensions because later on when we will begin to discuss about equations, you will see that those equations have letters in them and it's important for you to understand which letter corresponds to what. And so what you're looking at is a spring. And the first thing that I need to point out to you is that if you look carefully at this spring, you will see that two segments are missing. And this is the segment that connects this side to that side and the segment that connects this side to that side. And the reason they are missing is just for the purpose of analysis. Okay, so we did not draw them in this picture because we wanted to reveal uh, the inside of the wire of the spring so that we can label the spring properly. But in reality, those segments are actually present. And so a spring is made of a wire. Basically, the material that is used to make a spring no matter how thick that material is, we will always refer to that material as a wire. And the way the spring is made is by turning the wire in circles, okay? And so one of such circles is referred to as a coil, okay? So when we say a coil, we mean the circle uh, that you get when you turn the wire around itself, okay? And so a a, a spring will therefore have many coils, okay, on, uh, on top of each other, okay, and when we say the wire of the spring, we are referring to that material that is used to make coils and eventually to build the spring. So let us now look at the dimensions here. The first dimension I want to point out is the outer diameter of the spring, which you can also refer to as the outer diameter of a coil, okay? So this outer diameter here is the distance that you measure from the outer surface of the coil on one side to the outer surface of the coil on the other side. So if you measure that length, that will give you the outer diameter of the spring. And then you also have the inner diameter of the spring. This time we are measuring the length, but on the inside surface of the coil. So from the one side to the other, that gives you the inner diameter of the spring. And now if you sum the inner diameter and the outer diameter, and then you divide that by two, in other words, if you find the average of the inner and outer diameter of the spring, what you get is the mean diameter of the spring. And this is just the length that you will measure from the center of the wire on one side of a coil to the center of the wire on the other side of the coil. And the next diameter I am going to speak about is the diameter of the wire. And so that is the diameter of the cross section of the wire. Because if you look at the cross section of a wire, you will see that that is a circle. And so the diameter of that circle is small d. That's what we will refer to as small d. And that is the inner, I mean, that is the diameter of the wire, okay? It's the diameter of the wire. And then the next thing I am going to talk about is the pitch, okay? The pitch is the distance between the center of the wire of one coil to the center of the wire of the next coil. So when you measure that distance between two consecutive coils, from the center of the wire of the previous coil to the center of the wire of the next coil, that vertical distance in this case, of course, if the spring is lying horizontally, that will then be a horizontal distance. But in this case, it is a vertical distance. So that vertical distance uh, between uh, the centers of the wires uh, that make two consecutive coils, that distance is referred to as the pitch, P. Okay, and alpha here is the helix angle, okay, 
We will not use it very much in this module, but it's just important for you to see how it is measured. And finally, the length L that you see here, as you guessed it, is the length of the spring. But it's important to understand that a spring can be stretched and a spring can be compressed. And so when we say L, we refer to that as the free length because that is the length of the spring when it is not loaded. In other words, when it is not stretched and when or, or compressed. Okay, So when the spring is free, it's not loaded, the length that the spring has, that's what we will refer to as its free length. And that is what we use the letter L to represent. And so I'm going to recap. So L is the free length of the spring and we will measure that in meters. And even if the dimensions are given to you in millimeters, always before plugging them into your equations, change them to meters. The pitch is also measured in meters. Uh, and then you have the helix angle. As I said, we will not really use it in this module. And you have small d for the diameter of the wire, still in meters. d, which is the mean diameter of the spring, and that is in meters. And we will use that a lot, okay? And then you have the inner diameter of the spring in meters and the outer diameter of the spring in meters. Now, the inner diameter and the outer diameter of the spring are not really used in the equations. However, uh, you could find a question where instead of giving you the mean diameter of the spring, they give you the inner diameter and the outer diameter. Then, of course, you know what to do to get the mean diameter. It's just the average of the two. But what you will find in our equations in this module is that we will be using the mean diameter of the spring, D, capital D. Okay, very important. And so if we apply a load to this spring, okay, we will refer to that load as W. Okay, so all throughout this module, when a load is applied to the spring, we will refer to it as W. Sometimes the loads are tensile, sometimes the loads are compressive, but whether it is a tensile load or a compressive load, uh, a load of the same magnitude will cause a deformation of the same magnitude. What I mean by that is if you apply, for instance, 500 newtons and the spring stretches if it is a tensile load okay you apply a tensile load of 500 newtons and the spring stretches by uh, five centimeters that will mean if you apply a compressive load of 500 newtons it will compress by five centimeters okay so that is why sometimes in some of the questions they will not even specify to you whether the load applied was compressive or tensile okay if what they just if what they want to find is just the deformation, okay? But in this uh, picture, this is the tensile load. And all I wanted to show you is that when loads are applied on springs in this particular module, we will refer to them as W. And the unit will be, of course, Newtons, because loads are forces. Now, if you have a spring, okay, this time we have a spring and it's lying horizontally, okay, the coils at the end of the spring, we refer to them as end coils, okay. Those are the coils at the end of the spring. And now, why is it that these are important is because depending on the system that you're dealing with, you can find a system where these end coils are contributing to the behavior of the spring. And you can sometimes get a system where the end coils are not contributing to the behavior of the spring. So they do not contribute to the deformation of the spring. Okay, so if you have a situation where they contribute, then you will say that the end coils are active. If you have a situation where the end coils do not contribute to the deformation of the spring, okay, they do not affect the behavior of the spring in any way, then you will say that the end coils are inactive. And that will lead me to introduce the term active and inactive coils or non-active coils. It's the same thing. So we say that a coil is active if it is contributing to the 
deflection of the spring when it is loaded okay and of course non-active coils will be the ones that do not contribute to the deflection of the spring due to a certain load and so n is the number of active coils so you will see n a lot in our equations so when you see that small letter n it refers to the number of active coils and n total that is the total number of coils that a spring has okay both active and inactive okay so now if you get that n total is equal to n that will mean that all coils are active in the spring okay because n is the number of active coils so if n total is equal to n that will mean that all coils are active because n is the total number of coils okay but if you get that n total is equal to n plus 2 okay that will mean that the end coils are not active okay basically if the end coils are not active okay therefore the total number of coils will be equal to the number of active coils which is n plus the two inactive coils at the end but if all coils are active the total number of coils is going to be equal to the number of active coils because all coils are active Okay, I hope that was clear enough. And so let us look at this table here. Basically, this is a table that relates the end type of a spring, okay, the end type of a spring to uh, the total number of coils of that spring and to the free length of the spring and also to the solid length of the spring. Now, the free length of the spring I explained already, that is the length of the spring when it's not loaded, when you leave it free, okay? Now, the solid length of the spring, that is the length of the spring when it is fully compressed.